In, uh, in this last lecture, uh, we finally combine together all the ingredients that we introduced so far. So let me remind you what we have obtained so far. Um, <coughs> we, we gave a, a formal definition of a, of a conformal field theory in terms of um, operators and, and <coughs> and their properties. So uh, a conformal field theory for me is defined by uh, the conformal data, meaning uh, the CFT data, which is uh, the spectrum of the operators that you have. which is equivalent to provide two-point functions for all the operators in your theory. Uh, oh, let's say OI, OI for any operator. And then uh, you can call uh, interactions or OP coefficients, which uh, this is the statement that tells you how two operators combine and to give a um, an infinite set of operators, and this, um, this, these OP coefficients, sorry, OP coefficient, are equivalent to specifying all possible three-point functions that you can construct. So OI, OJ, OK, for any triplet IJK. Okay, so this is. Uh, this set of information specify uniquely uh, a theory. But now, uh, as we will see now, not all possible choices of spectra and OP coefficient are consistent. So one, one, one such uh, condition, as we have seen, is unitarity. So all, all this, uh, let me stress that all this comes from conformal symmetry only, okay? Uh, this is using the full power, the, the symmetry. Then there is a second ingredient, which is uh, unitarity. We are going to restrict ourselves to unitary theory. And unitarity is the second condition that you want to impose in your theory. <coughs> and this amounts to two things. Uh, one we have seen are the unitarity bounds. So uh, dimensions of, oper of primary operators, not descendants, but primary operators, they had to satisfy some condition, uh, which I will call delta unitarity, which depends on uh, uh, representation under Lorentz. We have seen that this, uh, this bound here is different for scalar and for traceless symmetric operator, and generically you can find such condition for any representation, okay? Uh, for instance, in four dimensions, let me give you an example. In four dimensions, okay, uh, representation of Lorentz are specified by two indices. Uh, so operators will belong to, uh, wi will be um, labeled by two indices, which are usually are called J and J bar. And J and J bar are integers. Basically, they, they, <coughs> they tell you how many dot and non dot indices you have in the spinner formalism. And then uh, for non scalars, the unitarity bound <coughs> are, some are something like uh, um, J plus J bar over 2 plus D minus, plus, well, minus 2. Sorry, plus 2. And for J equal J bar, this is a traceless symmetric operator, and you recover the old one. Then there is, there is a second uh, condition, which I, uh, I didn't present so far because lack of time. But you can show that unitarity also restricts the form of the OP coefficient. And in particular, they, ha they have to be real. In, for instance, the OP coefficient of scalar uh, this is what we wa we're going to need, so I'm going to only specify this. 
two scalars, uh, phi, phi, and a traceless symmetric operator. Oh. Sorry. This three point function is proportional to an OP coefficient, which I will call phi, phi, O, and this has to be real. Okay? So this is a consequence of unitarity. Um, okay, so far so good. And now, using the operator product expansion, I told you yesterday that um, you can start computing all possible correlation functions. But there is still a, a third ingredient, that, uh, a third constraint that you would like to impose in your theory, which is something that I mentioned the, fir the very first day, which is crossing symmetry. So today I'm going to uh, explain what crossing symmetry is. And you can think of crossing symmetry, an equivalent way of saying this, is that the <coughs> algebra of operators must be asso uh, associative. So associativity. of operator algebra. Okay, these are two equivalent statements. So what does it mean? Let's consider our four point uh, our favorite example, which is the four point function of four scalars. Okay. Phi one x1, phi2, x2, phi3, x3, phi4, x4. Okay, we have seen that this object <coughs> admits a, a very nice representation as sum over conformal blocks. So there is a prefactor here um, that you can I can write, let me see. Mm, okay. So let me let me write the, 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 the complete prefactor for different for not equal scalars, which I haven't write I have I never written so far. So there is this kinematic prefactor, K4, which depends on the dimension of the scalars and the coordinates times a function of the uh, conformal invariance uv which i defined yesterday and this prefactor here for generically can be written as so this is there is a usual prefactor one over x12 to the power Delta one plus delta two. Okay, th here there is a model so always. Huh? Delta x three four, delta three plus delta four. This is the u this is the prefactor that I always uh, wrote in the past lecture for, and it's o and it's the well this is the one that is present when you have uh, equal scalars. But then generically there is a there is more. And this is going to be um, x24 divided by x14 to the power delta 1, 2, which is the difference of the, uh, of the delta 1 and delta 2. And then there is x14, x13 to the power delta 3, 4. <coughs> this is just for, for completeness. And we al also seen that the this function G U V admits a uh, uh, very nice representation in terms of conformal blocks. Okay. So um 
Let's see. Um, <clears throat> so the conformer block decomposition that I obtained, in a sense I cheated because I, I made a choice implicitly. I decided that I wanted to perform a conformer block expansion in by taking the operator product expansion of, of the first two and the third and the fourth. Okay, that's the, this is uh, a possible uh, choice of pairing the, opera the, op the operators to give a conformal block decomposition of, of the four-point function. And when you do that, the, uh, the four-point function looks something like uh, <coughs> Modulus the prefactor, which I'm, I'm not going to carry around. We have this sum over all possible uh, operators that appear in the OPE of phi 1, phi 2, and also, and that also appear in the OPE phi 3, phi 4. Okay, otherwise there would not be any common, uh, so also must also appear here. Otherwise, the, uh, because the, the two-point two point function are diagonal, if this operator do not have, the, if, this oper if there is no operator that appears in both OP decomposition, the four-point function is just, is just, g just zero. And <coughs> in this sum, this sum is a sum over um, OP coefficient 1, 2, O, 3, 4, O, and then we have the conformal blocks G, which generically, if you have non equal external dimension, depends also on the difference, as we have seen yesterday. Delta 1, 2, delta 3, 4 depends on the dimension of the, the exchange operator, the spin of the exchange operator, and there is a u. Uh, let, me, let me use this bar. Okay. And <coughs> there is a prefactor, sorry, there is a, a, an additional factor that I'm, I'm going to use, I'm going to need, so I'll, I'll write it is ZZ bar. Well, this basically is, let me write it and then I explain. Delta 1 plus delta 2 over 2. Okay. So in order to go from here to here, what I've done, I have fixed the, I've, I've, I, I went to my favorite conformal frame where x1 is equal to 0, x3 is equal to uh, 0, 1, x4 is 0, infinity, okay, <coughs> and um, x2 is, let's say, zero z plus z minus z bar over two z plus z bar over two okay this is my my conformal frame and corresponds to this picture zero one and infinity this is this is a gauge fixing of conformal symmetry that we always do, and when you do that, this prefactor collapses just to this uh, denominator. And I also did the conformal blocks decomposition. So this, as I said, is one possible pairing, but in principle, uh, no one forbids me to do a different pairing. Okay. So just to give a um, a graphical picture of what I'm uh, what I'm doing here. Um, let's say these are my four operators. 
phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4. Okay. What I'm doing, I'm pairing the first one, the, fir the first and the second, with the OP, the third and the fourth with the OP, and then exchanging the, op the operator O, and I'm summing over O. Okay, this is sort of Feynman diagram, if you want. And the vertex here is the OP coefficient. F1 to O. Okay. And the propagator, the would be propagator, is the conformal block. <coughs> this is one possibility. Another possibility is to pair the operators in a different way. So, for instance, I could decide to, um, to do the um, conformal block decomposition, one with four. Uh, sorry, here it's better if I... Mm. Let me call this four and this three. I could decide to pair one with, one with four and two with three. Okay, this is another choice. Of course, not, uh <coughs> you have to be sure that both OP converge. But there will, you, uh, you, as you, you can verify yourself, there is a finite region in this, in this Z plane where both OP converge. Okay, so I'm going to assume that I live in that configuration. So in particular, if you are in the neighborhood of, is a region which contains, for instance, this, this li the zero, the the line zero one. Okay, so if I do the the, the, other, the, the second config, the second OP expansion, I'm gonna end up with a different expansion. And pictorially, this corresponds to do a different expansion, a different contraction. I'm going to sum over different set of operators now, and because the the the, <coughs> the kind of OPE that I'm considering is different, so in principle there could be different operator appearing. Okay, and there will be different OPE coefficient appearing. F two three O and F one four O prime. And so, in uh, to write a formula that this corresponds to a sum over operators O prime that are present in the OP expansion of phi one times phi four, and are present also in the OP expansion phi two phi three. And <coughs> so this will be sum over, sorry, F um, one four O prime, F two three O prime, and then in principle you would have a conformal block for this expansion. Now let's look for a second at this expansion. This expansion is equivalent. Uh, what I can do, I can permute the, the operators, since these are bosons. So uh, in Euclidean, um, operators are, are must be radially ordered, so it doesn't matter where you put them. Uh, in Minkowski, you can say, uh, as long as these objects are at space-like separation, they commute. So le let's assume we are in this configuration, so I can commute the object as, uh, as I want. So I can consider this. This, this, this. These two things are just equal. Um, I x two, and x three. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Let's me let me do this. I prefer. 
Okay, and then I can redo. So the the op expansion above is corresponds to this one, and for this one I I know exactly what it, what it is. It's just a conformal block decomposition. The only thing that you have to be careful uh, with is that is a conformal block decomposition where you exchange the role of two two and four. Okay, you, we exchange the 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 indices two and four. So I can just rewrite this conformal block decomposition where I send x2 to x4 and vice versa. Now if you do that <coughs> and you remember the definition of the, the conformal invariants u and v, these are x12, x34 <coughs> divided by x13, x24 and v is x14 x23 x13 x24 okay <coughs> exchanging x2 with x4 is equivalent to exchange u and v okay and in the variable zz bar this is z z bar this is one minus z, one one minus z bar. <coughs> this this uh, exchange of coordinates corresponds to send z into one minus z, and similarly for z bar into one minus z bar. Okay, so in this the conformal block decomposition, I can just use the expression before, but doing this this. Uh, flip. And so here I'm going to have conformal blocks of, and I also have to exchange 2 with 4 in the external dimension. So I'm going to have here delta um, 1, 4, delta 3, 2. Sorry, 2, 3. fact there is a relation you can flip them it doesn't matter delta o prime l o prime and then here i'm gonna have one minus z one minus z bar divided by the same denominator with one minus z and one minus z bar one minus z one minus z bar to the power delta 2 plus delta 3. Um, so delta, sorry, delta 4. Um, delta 2 plus delta 4. Right? Sorry, what? Oh, do we? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> so now we have we have these two constraints. You have two equations, and they must be equal. Yes. Um, no, they're not the same. One, one is this. Okay. Um, but the one, you, yeah. Okay. So we have two equations, and they must agree. So crossing symmetry is this is exactly this this statement. Is the statement that two different op expansion must agree. And
So you see, it's very non-trivial statement if you have different operators in the if you have different operators, uh, so phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, phi 4 are not, are not all equal, this is a very non-trivial statement because it involves <coughs> sums over different set of operators, generically. So in the even, but even in the case where, uh, which is the one that I'm going to consider now, even in the case where all op uh, operators are equal, um, the statement is non-trivial. So let me speci uh, specify to a uh, simple case. Phi i are all equal, which means delta i are all equal to uh, delta phi. Okay, so I'm going to restrict to a very simple case. <coughs> So in that case, the the two sums run over the same um, the same set of operators because the two op the, the two op expansion are the, are equivalent, and on top of that, these um, these two op coefficients are e are equal. So I just get a square, and the difference of external dimension vanish. So I'm not going to write them anymore. Um, but still, I have a crossing symmetry equation. Which is the, f which pictorially looks like this. Sum over operators in the phi phi OPE. Um, this minus that equal to zero, which in formulas becomes something like this. Sum over uh, operators. Well, first of all, let me, re let me remind you that in the, operate in the OPE expansion of two scalars, we can only have traceless symmetric operators. So uh, in this sum, I'm going to sum over traceless symmetric operators. And traceless symmetric operators are uh, identified by the scaling dimension, which we call delta, and the spin. So I'm going to sum over delta and L, which are the dimensions, and the spin of all possible traceless symmetric operators appearing in this expansion. On both sides of the equation, I'm going to have uh, the OP coefficient phi phi O square. So this is going to be f five. Uh, <coughs> let me call this this object lambda square delta l. And yeah, this corresponds to f phi phi operator delta l square. Okay, just a coefficient which is, uh, po so lambda square is positive because this coefficient f are real because of unitarity. And then here I have, um <coughs> let's see what I have. I have the conformal block g delta l of zz bar and then uh, zz bar to the power delta minus delta phi minus the, the, the same object with z and z bar uh, in flipped to one minus z bar and one minus z. So one minus z, one minus z bar to the power minus delta phi and then same conformal block, g delta l, but as a function of 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. Okay, so in the, in this, in the case of equal uh, scalars, uh <coughs> this is the crossing symmetry equation. And the important remark is that this object 
is, first of all, is known because it involves known functions. We compute them yesterday. In two and four dimension, these are literally known functions. In, in, sorry, in two and four dimension, or even actually even any even dimension, these are, are known. In odd dimensions, we saw yesterday that you can compute to arbitrary precision. So let me assume that these are known functions. But the important remark is that this is non-zero. Okay. Generically, this object is non-zero. And but the sum has to be equal to zero with positive coefficient in front. So this is a, an important statement. Uh, the sum must, must be, so this constraint has to be equal to zero, so the sum has to be equal to zero, but the is not, full, is not satisfied term by term. It's not that each term of the sum is zero and then you're done, okay? It must be really a conspiracy of all the terms that sum up to zero. And this is, this is, uh, this is, this is the crossing symmetry equation. So here I'm gonna add crossing symmetry. Yes? Yes, there is. Um, I'm gonna write it now. Okay, let, let me let me just answer the question. In principle, yes, you can do the other. Um, <coughs> the other corresponds. So here, this corresponds to flip. For instance, two and four. You can flip one and two. Sorry, one and two it does, doesn't add you anything. Uh, you can flip the other one, uh, one and four. Uh, one and four. Okay, and it turns out that th in that case, uh, because of some property of the conformal blocks, the sum is satisfied term by term. Uh, so there is a, a relation of the conformal blocks that perhaps I have I have here. Let me see. So first of all, the other term is not that simple because the transformation one going to four uh, sends, I think, u. So if you do. One to four, um, you send u in u over v, if I if I remember correctly, and v in one over v. You can check. Uh, or something like that. So it's a slightly more complicated, but there is a nice um <coughs> there is a nice uh, property of the conformal block which is g of u v, so delta l u over v, one over v. This is minus one to the l, g of u v. Let me just check that it's correct. Yeah. And if you have external dimension, it's slightly more complicated, but it's something like that. And therefore, because in this, uh, in this simple case, you L is always even, they term, they, the two terms of the crossing equation, they just cancel exactly. Okay. So I'm not going to consider the other. But in principle, if you have more external, different external operators, you might have to consider different crossing equations. Generically, there is not only one crossing equation, there are more than one. So crossing symmetry here. Is this equation in this particular simple case. And this equation is a functional equation in terms of the CFT data, right? This equation tells you that not all possible, well, as we will see now, not all possible choices of delta and L and, and OP coefficient F uh, will be consistent, okay? This is literally, literally a constraint on the CFT data. It's not a constraint on CZ bar, 
because it has to hold for any Z and Z bar. It's a constraint beca because the functional dependence on Z and Z bar is completely fixed by conformal symmetry. So this is a constraint on the spectrum and the interaction of your theory. And the idea of the conformal bootstrap is to study this equation and deduce from, from this equation which kind of uh, spectra and OP coefficient are consistent with this list of constraints. Okay, this is the philosophy of the conformal bootstrap. So, and how are we going to do that? Well, first of all, let me, let me complete my definition of, of CFTs. So for me, a CFT is, <coughs> as written in this blackboard, is a list of, of, of CFT data satisfying unitarity constraint and satisfying crossing symmetry for all possible, for all possible four-point function. Okay, all of them. Any four-point function you can construct, you can think about. So any four-plet of operator that you can take out of your spectrum, it has to satisfy crossing symmetry. And you can show that if this is um, satisfied, then any other higher endpoint end correlation function will satisfy crossing symmetry. So this is literally, this is sufficient condition also. Okay. Um, you can show this, for instance, five, if you take fi uh, five point function, you can write that in, in terms of, let's say, let's try to do this example. You have five points. <coughs> I can pair two of them uh, in an OPE and then pair some other two. Um, things like this. Sorry. Uh, yes. So this is a point function. Okay. So if this is crossing symmetric, it means that you can exchange, for instance, this can, you can take this to be um, so you want to pair uh, so you want to switch and pair these two, for instance and pair these two. Okay. We, and here we have used the crossing symmetry of this subset of four points. And, and similarly, you can, you can, you can use uh, crossing symmetry uh, in any subset of four points and prove that it's crossing symmetry. So you can, you can rearrange the points, the OPE, as you want, just by using the crossing symmetry of the four-point function. So, how do we study uh, this crossing symmetry equation? Well, the idea is that um, is to consider these functions as vectors in some space. If you want to be formal, this function can be considered as vectors in the space of functions of with two variables. But to be more concrete, let me take this, equ this equation and Taylor expand in CNC bar around some point. What is the best point to expand? Well, um, if you remember, this, um, this uh, conformal block here, they have a nice expansion. So these are just the upper geometric functions, so they have a nice expansion, for instance, in ZZ bar going to zero, which is the OP limit. Or if you think as uh, an expansion in the radial direction, they have a, a Taylor expansion in, in R, the radius, which again is ZZ bar going to zero. So this, this first piece has uh, a, a nice Taylor expansion for ZZ bar going to zero. This second piece has a nice Taylor expansion for ZZ bar going to one. So the, uh, you can guess that the best uh, 
um, the, the best point to expand around is the crossing symmetric point. So uh, the crossing symmetric point is z z bar equal one half. Okay. And this in the radial coordinates, uh, if you're curious, this corresponds to r equal uh, 3 minus 2 square root of 2 and eta equal 1. So to be very concrete, I'm going to take this, um <coughs> this equation here and consider the first n derivatives uh, around this crossing symmetric point. This, of course, will not... Uh, in, in doing that, I'm, I'm throwing away a lot of information. But nevertheless, it's going to be a consistent set of equations. So, uh, and also, I would like to define some functions. Uh, so this combination here, in the parentheses, I will define as a function f delta l on z and z bar and also depends on the external dimension. Let me put it here, delta phi. Okay. So <coughs> my crossing equation can be written uh, as a sum over delta and L. Um <coughs> coefficient, positive coefficient lambda square delta L. And then here I'm taking a bunch of derivatives. So I'm going to have F delta L uh, delta phi at the crossing symmetric point. So um, one half, one half. Then I'm taking derivatives. So eventually we'll get F delta L delta phi n derivative with respect to n to z, m derivative with respect to z bar, evaluated at one half, one half, okay, after a certain order. And to be concrete, I'm going to take n plus m smaller or equal than some cutoff lambda. And this equation, again, has to be equal to zero. So some of these vectors, these are now are literally vectors. They don't depend on ZZ bar anymore. They are vectors. And as we saw yesterday, we can compute co uh, derivatives of conformal blocks in a very efficient way. So here, this starts to, uh, here you start seeing why yesterday we focused on computing derivatives of conformal blocks. So now we can start having an intuition about this, this, uh, uh, this crossing equation. So I would like to, to start giving a geometric picture. As I said, uh, the, the full set of conditions would be for lambda in infinity, of, of course, right? When you consider all possible derivatives, it, considering all possible derivatives is equivalent to consider uh, the full equation. But for the purpose of, of drawing and the purpose of in intuition, let me stick to a finite number of derivatives. This will be a necessary set of constraints. Yes. Um, which term, sorry? Uh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, you mean this? This one. Yeah, yeah, you derive everything. Sure. So the, the, the function f 
is this combination. Okay? And then you take derivatives with respect to the z bar of everything. Okay? But it's a, it's a function, you can compute derivatives. Okay? So this is the key, the key step. So if, if you have questions, please ask me. Um, so what, I, what this function is telling us is that a certain combination of vectors with positive co coefficient must sum to zero. Okay. So in particular, uh, let me let me do uh, a slight manipulation. Let me strip. Uh, let me isolate the contribution of the identity. Okay. Because in this uh, in this sum, you have all po all possible operators appearing in the OPE, and the OPE of two scalars starts with the identity, right? Uh, and the, the <coughs> OP coefficient of the identity has been chosen to be one, is the normalization of the two-point function, plus other terms. So here I know exactly what, the, what is the contribution of the identity. So let me take a, a sign prime, meaning that I don't have the contribution of the identity, and then I'll put the contribution of the identity on the other side, minus F. Uh, so the identity is zero, zero. vector delta phi okay so because this vector I know exactly what it, what it is because there is no OP coefficient in front and because I've normalized my OP coefficient such that the contribution of the identity is just has OP coefficient 1 <coughs> So now, uh, just to repeat, a certain sum of vectors with positive coefficient must be equal not to zero now, but to this vector which is known. And so let me start cons uh, rephrasing this in a geometrical picture. Here I have vectors, so let me draw a bunch of vectors. I have vectors for each delta and for each L, I have vectors. Okay. So this is, let's say, delta 1, L1, uh, delta 2, L2. And eventually you will have infinite number of vectors because the uh, sum over primaries in the OP expansion is an infinite sum. Okay, so here I have many of them. Delta n, Ln, infinite, in infinitely many. And I'm taking combinations of these vectors with positive coefficient. And this defines a cone. It's a convex, it's a convex space, right? This is the space of all possible combination of vectors with positive coefficient. It's just the, the cone. Is, is just a certain cone. Okay, is this clear? And what I'm saying is that uh, a certain combination of this vector must reproduce the vector on the right-hand side, which means that the vectors on the right hand side must be inside this cone. Whoops. Okay, so this is minus F identity. F zero zero. Can you read? So the crossing symmetry is the statement that uh, the contribution of the, the vector corresponding to the identity must be inside this cone. Because if it's not inside the cone, there is no possible choice of OP coefficient that, sum ca that can give you this, uh, this vector. Is it clear? But now, okay, this is, this is a nice interpretation, but now let's, let's, let's assume that um, so in a generic CFT, if I don't, in a generic unitary CFT, this must be true, because we know that there are examples of the ex ex CFT existing, so uh, eventually this has to be true. Uh, but then let's assume that I want to explore assumptions of my theory. Okay, let's assume that I want to say, let's see, uh, the vector delta one and delta two are not present. So delta one, L one. 
is not part of the spectrum. And similarly, delta 2 L2 is not part of the CFT. Okay. If I do that, then the cone shrinks. Okay. I pass from, from this cone to a, diff to a, a, a narrower cone, which uh, it's only made out of the other vectors. So in this, ah, damn, this is the wrong chunk. So this is delta, let's say delta 3, L3. There is still delta N, Ln. And there is the cone spanned by all these vectors. But then now the vector of the identity is outside. So this means that this assumption is inconsistent with crossing symmetry. Because there is no, possi there is no possible choice of the uh, OP coefficient and vectors not containing delta 1 and delta 2 that can reproduce this, this vector. Okay, so eventually there will be, so this is how the crossing symmetry can constrain the, uh <coughs> the, s the spectrum of your theory. Okay, you cannot remove too many operators from your spectrum and still be consistent with, uh, with crossing. Eventually, you will end up, uh, well, this is not guaranteed, but eventually, if you make too strong assumptions, you might end up with a too, na too narrow cone, too narrow space, which, not that, which does not allow you to reproduce the right-hand side, which is fixed. Okay? So this is the philosophy. And in the... So this is a geometrical picture, but can be formalized a little bit better with the language of linear functionals. Um, which are probably, let me, let me just do that, and then we can take a break. First of all, what does it mean that the, the vector 1 is outside the cone? In this very simple geometrical picture, it means that there exists a plane, okay, plane that, for, from which, uh, that separates the cone on one side from the vector, uh, from the vector identity on the other side. Here there is no such a plane, here there is a plane. And let me call this plane alpha. Okay. So let me now restate this condition of the existence of a plane in terms of uh, linear functionals acting on the space of, this, uh, of these functions f. Okay. So the existence of, ex existence of alpha is equivalent to the existence of uh, a linear functional functional alpha which sends al the, the functions f delta l zz bar to a real number Okay, so this is a linear function um, such that alpha acting on f delta l delta phi is positive. Okay, so all the vectors are on one side; they're positive. So the scalar, pro if you want, the scalar product of this vector, um, the scalar product of the, per the, the vector perpendicular to the plane is positive. 
while uh, if you want alpha acting on minus the identity, or if you want the identity, um, sorry, zero, zero, is negative. And this has to be, the, the condition above has to be true for any delta and L in the CFT. Well, not in the CFT, but in the OPE phi phi. For any delta L of the operators appearing in the OPE phi phi. Okay, and what is this functional? Well, you can parameterize the functional L alpha as a sum and m for instance so this is a choice of functional of a choice of a linear functional for instance sum over n and m with n plus m smaller than capital lambda some coefficient lambda and m and then derivative with respect to z and derivative with respect to z bar m. Okay. If you can find such a functional, which is a combination of derivatives, acting on the crossing equation, you, will, you would be in such, a co in such a configuration. Why? Because if I take my crossing symmetry equation act with a functional, I get uh, positive on one side and negative on the other side, which is uh, a contradiction. Right? So if I start from sum over delta L, uh, sorry, this lambda here are not the lambda that were in the crossing equation. Okay, let me... Uh, Perhaps I should use a different letter. Let's call it alpha, alpha m. <coughs> so here I had lambda square, delta L functions, delta L, delta phi, z z bar. Let's do the sum prime. So this is equal to minus f, zero, zero, delta phi, z z bar. And now I act with such a functional uh, on both sides. Uh, on one side, I get sum of uh, lambda square uh, alpha of f. Okay, the notation here is a bit heavy. Okay, which by definition is positive. And it's multiplied by positive coefficients, so the whole thing is is positive. But on the other side, I get alpha of minus f zero zero z z bar, which by construction is negative. And so this is a contradi contradiction. So where is the contradiction? The contradi contradiction is. Uh, in assuming that only certain operators are present in the CFT. Okay. If, I, uh, if I find such a function, it means that the operators that I included in my CFT are not enough. I, I made too strong assumptions. If I don't find such a functional, I cannot conclude anything. I can, I, I'm, just I, I'm just observing the crossing that my choice of spectrum is consistent with the CFT. But I, I cannot infer anything more than that. And so the bootstrap, the numerical bootstrap at least, you can think of a sort of b black box, well, which is not that black because we started unpacking in the, in the, in the tutorials. But um, so we have the, the bootstrap, numerical bootstrap. You feed to the numerical bootstrap 
um, a spectrum or a set of assumptions, okay, this is equivalent to give a set of assumptions And by running, by looking for the existence of contradictions, okay, so looking for the existence of functional like this, you can either conclude that uh, there is no CFT with that consistent with that spectrum, simply because crossing symmetry is violated, or maybe there is a CFT. You cannot, of course, uh, this is wh wh what, I've dis what I discuss here is uh, a necessary condition. It's not sufficient to tell you that the, the CFT exists. Okay? But as we will see, this already this dichotomy is powerful enough to allow you to, to, to obtain very non-trivial information. Okay. I think I'm going to stop here for, uh, for a break. And if there are questions, this is the main logic, so please ask questions. Yes. So if you only assume unitarity bounds, um, you, must be, you must be consistent because unitarity bounds are, for, for instance, uh, well, there are CFTs that satisfy uh, unitarity bounds, and they, we know they exist. I will discuss them. For instance, free theory is an example. Uh, so if you take a free field, there is a field that, sa that saturates the unitarity bound. So. Right, so very good. So if we remove, so perhaps the question is, if I remove the, cross, uh, the unitarity condition, do I still get something? And the question is no, for two reasons. First, if I remove unitarity, this one does do not have to be positive. And so you, you, can, you are summing vector with arbitrary coefficient, you can always sum to, to zero or two a given vector. And second of all, even if you keep this, this quantity to be positive, but you start taking you start exchanging operator below the unitarity bound, so delta and L are below the unitarity bound, then um, the conformal block basically lo loses their positivity properties, and eventually the cone is not a cone but fills the whole space. Okay? Well, this is a very good question. So. Well, it's, it's not automatic, but most of the ca in many cases you see that there are no co simply no no con uh, yeah it's it's automatically at least for the case of equal scalar you can if you go below the unitarity bound you see that it's trivial everything is satisfied. Other questions? Okay, let's stop now and then discuss uh, applications. Okay, so let's continue the discussion. Uh, let me just point out uh, that before I was missing uh, one, one little thing in the definition of the functional, which is uh, you take derivatives evaluated at a given point, okay? Just to, otherwise it's not a function. Uh, you have to take derivatives and evaluate the derivative at a given point, and that will provide something will give you a number. Okay, so let's try to understand a little bit how this, uh, how you can infer, how, how can you can take uh, abstract information out of this uh, reasoning. Okay, and let me do a, a very simple example, which I can draw on the on the blackboard, which is the free theory in four dimensions. So I want to study 
uh, I want to extract information about the free theory in four dimension, which is a bit silly because we know exactly what free theory is. But so let's assume we have a scalar with dimension uh, delta phi equal to one. And in the OPE of phi with phi, we know exactly what, what there is. There is the identity, there is uh, phi square, and then there are a bunch of operators, and you, you can actually write these operators. Those are all conserved, uh, all conserved charges uh, made out of two fields and um, sticking L derivatives. So uh, schematically, I will write these operators of this form, phi d mu 1, d mu L phi. This is schematic because you have to take First of all, you have to subtra subtract traces, and also, but uh, and also you have to subtract descendants. But okay. but they are of this form. Okay, these are the conserved charges. And so, for instance, you would like suppose you don't know this, and you would like to show that the theory uh, must contain this operator. Okay. So how do we do that? So we start studying the four-point function phi 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 of a free scalar in four dimensions. We know exactly the conformal blocks. And then uh, we would like to apply the reasoning of before. And to make the reasoning simple, I would restrict myself to the case where lambda is equal to two. So I'm only taking two derivatives. And you can, you can inspect that the conformal blocks are actually uh, only have uh, even derivatives. So, <coughs> I will inspect the plane of the function of the, let's say, two derivative with respect to z. And the other direction would be zero two. Okay, so I'm taking derivatives and I have vectors, and now I want to draw vectors in in this plane. And let me start from uh, L equal two. Okay. So uh, L equal two, the dimension starts at four. So we have an operator, let's say it's, it's here. And then as you increase delta, uh, you, can, you, can, I mean you can do this, this plot, and you get something like this. And eventually it approaches infinity. If you, if you keep them normalized, it, this, uh, this line ends somewhere. And, and similar, so let me draw this line. Okay. And similarly, you can... Uh <coughs> You can uh, draw, so this, this function here is, so this, this trajectory here is the trajectory spanned by the vectors as you increase delta. So this delta larger than 4. Okay? Each value of delta corresponds to a vector. And then you can draw the other lines corresponding to other spins. So, uh, for instance, L equal 4. And you will see that they all start on the same line, and they go like this. L equals 6. They go like this. OK? And now, let's, so, so far I only consider, uh, and then they're all like this. They never cross. They all stay on this, on this side, and they all start on this line, and they stay below. And now you would like to. Uh, <coughs> you would like to, to draw the line associated to the scalar, for instance. And now this has a very nice, uh, has a completely different uh, trajectory, in particular when delta, so L equals zero, delta going to infinity, so let's start from the other side, it starts somewhere here, okay? And then as delta decreases, it approaches this line, and then eventually it bends, it comes back. 
So this is delta equal one. Sorry, uh, one. This point here. Sorry, uh, I think uh, no, it's something like this, if I remember correctly. Okay, so let's look at this picture for a second. Uh, the crossing symmetry is the statement that all vector in this plane, all vectors, the sum of vector, and the identity it's here, right? It's zero zero. I, I, in this plane, the, the identity you can you can put it there. You can put it there. So. Um, Okay, to be to be fair, you should you should risk a little bit uh, the vectors. So assu uh, let's assume that I rescale vector such that the identity, it's. So I'm looking at this plane in the, in the in the direction perpendicular to the identity. Okay, so this is the identity. To make this the uh, picture very precise. So s a crossing symmetry is the statement that whatever combination of of OP coefficient that you take with, 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 with positive OP coefficient of these vectors that you take, it must sum to zero in this in this uh, in this plane. Okay, and so you see very well that if you if you make the assumption that all scalars, so assumption number one, all scalars all L equals zero operators have dimension delta larger than a certain delta star, which is the point where this line crosses this uh, diagonal. Okay. If you make this assumption, then all the vectors will lie on the same side of this line. And so there is no possible way in which you can sum them to zero because they all lie on the same side. Oh, sorry, here strictly large. Okay. So um in fact even if it's smaller in this particular case uh because for the theory actually only conserve current appear, you know that the only operator that appear in, in your OPE are on these lines. So in order to compensate the presence of these operators, you actually need something on the other side of the line, which is precisely this one. Okay? But <coughs> if you did this assumption, you would have concluded that the, th the theory is inconsistent. So with this, with this assumption, there is no CFT. Okay. Instead, in order to compensate the presence of uh, all this operator that lies on the same s on one side, you need something that lies on the other side. So you need something below or above, sorry, this diagonal. And in a free theory, because you know that the only operator that appears are here, you actually conclude more. You can say that the operator delta star must be present. And if you look carefully at delta star, you will discover that delta star is actually 2. Okay, so with a very simple plot, you can show that in the free theory, you need an operator in the OPE with dimension You need a scalar with dimension two. Okay, is the logic clear? Yes. This one. So this is the trajectory spanned by the op the scalar operators as a function of delta. I mean, I'm plotting this from the unitarity bound to infinity. Okay. And it's not normalized to one, so that at some at certain point it just uh, it goes somewhere. Yeah. If you don't normalize to one, it just grows. But if you normalize to one, it 
uh, uh, asymptotes or something. And so, but the logic, the, the, the punchline is that if you, if you have operators that lie on the same side of a, of a plane, you need something that compensates. So you need something living here. You cannot assume that all operators, all the scalar operators, for instance, are above this delta star because you, you could not sum the vectors to, to zero. You need something here. And for free theory, you know, you know, you know better because you know that only conserved operators appear and they all lie on the same line, so you need something on the other side of the origin to compensate so that combination of these ones will be compensated by the presence of the other operator. Okay. So now we would like to, okay, this is very, uh, this is a cartoon. Uh, we would like to make it m a little bit more systematic, and in particular, we would like to study theories where you don't have this, this much information. So you would like to make this, this method very general, and to do that, we, uh, we have to go back for a second to this, uh, um <coughs> to this interpretation. So if you don't like thinking in terms of vectors and, and trajectories, you can just think in terms of linear functionals. So you would like to check for a given external dimension delta phi. So this we can fix. This is the dimension of the operator that we are probing. Okay. We, we can check if there exists a linear functional that satisfies this condition um, for any delta and L that we allow to appear in the OPE. And what, is this con well, what, is, what are this set of conditions? Well, first of all, there are two strategies which uh, we sort of investigated in the first tutorial uh, on Wednesday. One possibility is to not impose positivity for all for all uh, deltas and l but just discretize delta okay so you don't impose positivity um on all deltas you just impose positivity of the function f delta l Larger than zero for delta one, delta two, delta max. Okay, so yeah, we had to truncate in delta and discretize in delta. And if you do that, and then of course L equal to zero, two, L max. Okay, if you do that, uh, this condition is translated, is recasted, in a set of linear equations. Okay? Because uh, what, <coughs> what this alpha is doing is taking derivatives, then you evaluate at points, you fix the dimension, you fix the spin, so uh, the condition is, this condition here is simply sum over n and m, lambda and m some coefficient which i will call f and m which depends on delta e l e and delta phi larger or equal than zero okay and you have one of them for each delta Uh, one equation for each delta E and L E. Okay, so if you do this truncation, um, you translated the problem into a set of linear equations, 
And the only thing that you, so the existence of the functional corresponds to find a set of coefficient lambda and m that satisfies a bunch of linear equations. And this is precisely a linear programming, a, li a linear, pro linear programming problem, which we dis obtained last, last, we discussed the other day. The existence of a functional can be recasted in a linear programming problem. Okay, um, so this is a set of conditions, and you want to see, you want to test the feasibility of a, a, a huge system of equations. Okay, if the system is feasible, meaning it means that such 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 set of coefficient lambda and m exist. And then you found the contradiction. And so the, 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 the set of deltas and set of L's that you used are not, uh, are not consistent with crossing symmetry. If you don't find, uh, if, the, if, if the, the system of equation is unfeasible, you cannot conclude anything. It just means that you haven't, find, you haven't found a functional. Okay. So this is the logic. Now, of course, this logic here has a, a weak, a weak uh, point, which is the discretization and the truncation. Okay, you have to truncate, you have to discretize in order to have a finite number of linear equations, and this is not very good. So that's why uh, we uh, would like a better method, which is uh, where the semi-definite programming enter in the game. Okay, so suppose now you don't dis you don't want to discretize and you don't want to truncate in delta max, okay? Then you have um, this 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 blackboard becomes um <coughs> sum of uh, with and m lambda and m functions f and m which are the derivatives but now these derivatives are function of delta which is not discretized okay and the spin the, sp the spin is just an integer number so it's not a big problem but delta is a continuum and that's fine But we saw yesterday that, so this function here is a combination of conformal blocks, and conformal blocks can be, derivative of conformal blocks have a nice representation in terms of uh, uh, rational functions of delta. Divided by... Uh, <coughs> Some polynomial delta L. The, 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 the denominator does not depend on the external dimension. So we saw that this is possible. Uh, the derivatives of conformal blocks have a nice representation in terms of uh, rational functions. And on top of that, the denominator is always positive. for any delta larger than delta unitarity. Okay, so, and this has to be um, larger than zero. So this condition is, is, is a semi-definite prob problem. It's a combination of polynomials, okay, that has to be zero, that has to be larger than zero. This is precisely the problem that we uh, discussed the first day. Okay. It's a combination of polynomials because the, the denominator is common for all the derivatives. It doesn't depend on NM, it doesn't depend on external dimension. I can just remove it. Okay. This is it's equivalent to say that sum of NM, lambda NM, polynomials NM, 
delta L delta phi larger than zero. And this is a semi-definite programming problem. So the whole point of conformal blocks expansion is to, sorry, the, the, the whole difficulty, if you want, in the conformal bootstrap is to compute this, um, this polynomial, this rational approximation or this polynomial truncation of the conformal blocks. If you manage to do that, then you can feed this expression to uh, softwares like SDPB and start looking for the existence of this. If you find it, it means that, uh, sorry, here, um, delta, um, this is delta uh, in the spectrum. Okay, not for all deltas, only for the deltas in the spectrum. So if you find this, this, this uh, solution of this problem, it means that the spectrum that you have used is not consistent with crossing. If you don't find it, uh, you cannot conclude anything. Okay. So now let's, let's try to study some concrete example. Other questions? Okay. Um, so I would like to show you what you can do now that we have built all this machinery. And the simple example that you can do is to study CFTs. Let's say in two dimension where we actually know a lot of things so we can test our method uh, against uh, known results and I'm only using Novi Resolve here I'm only using the global symmetry so the same machinery will apply to higher dimensions and <coughs> The very first, the very first question that you can ask is consider a scalar, which I will call sigma, for reason that we can become clear in a second, and then which has dimension delta sigma, and then I can consider the four-point function sigma of x1 sigma of x2, sigma of x3, sigma of x4, okay? And I want to study crossing symmetry of this equation. So in order to do that, I have to um, understand a little bit better the uh, operator product expansion sigma sigma. So sigma sigma is the OPE of two scalars so we know what it is, more or less. It will contain the identity. Okay. It will contain scalars. Well, generically it contains traceless symmetric operators. In particular, it contains scalars, and uh, I will call epsilon the first scalar. The first scalar. First in, dim in dimension, okay? It's the lowest dimensional scalar. Epsilon um, <coughs> with dimension delta epsilon. And here there will be higher dimensional scalar. Scalars. And uh, higher spins, higher spins. In particular, there will be the energy momentum tensor, there will be all, all other spins, okay? It's an infinite sum. And the very naive question that you can ask is, okay, how heavy or how high can the dimension of epsilon be and still be consistent with crossing symmetry? 
This is a legitimate question. Can I make epsilon arbitrarily large? Sorry, can I make delta epsilon arbitrarily large? Or does crossing symmetry put some bound on its dimension? Okay, so um, let me make a, a plot here. As a function of delta, I can, uh, I can try to answer this question as a function of delta sigma. And here on the vertical axis, I will, uh, will def I, I will put delta epsilon. And so fixing delta, delta sigma, I can ask, okay, uh, let's put this one for instance. Um, <coughs> I can choose a point here in this, in this plane and check if using one of my favorite programs, I can check if I can find a functional that makes the, 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 the theory inconsistent, okay? Notice that when I, when I choosing a point, what I meaning, what I really mean is that epsilon as dimension, so I'm allowing in the OPE, okay? A point here means that I'm allowing in the OPE only operators, scalar operators, uh, with dimension, so delta scalar must be larger or equal than delta epsilon. This is the, re the assumption that I'm making. Okay? Whenever I choose a point, the assumption that I'm making is that all scalars are larger than this, 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 this value. Okay? That's the assumption. And I want to test this assumption using this machinery. So you can do that, and if you do that, you obtain something like this. Um, so you, you obtain an, a plot like this one, where the region below is allowed, and the region above is excluded. What does it mean? It means that if I have an operator with dimension delta sigma, in the OPE, I must have at least one operator, one scalar operator with dimension below this line. This is the conclusion that I'm making, okay? I'm not inferring any existence of CFT. This is a necessary condition of all CFTs. There's no assumption here besides unitarity. It's very powerful. Okay. No assumptions besides unitarity and conformal symmetry and crossing symmetry, and yet I can exclude a huge chunk of parameter space. And then you see that something fun is going on uh, at this one body, one eight, one, and those of you that are familiar with two-dimensional CFTs might, know this, might, might recognize these values because these values are precisely the dimension of the sigma operator and the epsilon operator in the two-dimensional Ising mode. So in two dimensions, there is a set of minimal models which are uh, exactly, exactly solvable. Min model. Okay. These are exactly solvable, and you can compute the dimension of, of the operators appearing uh, in this uh, <coughs> in these models, and it turns out that, in particular, uh, so let me, these are exactly solvable models. Okay, so all dimensions, all deltas, O and and also the uh, OP coefficient f i j k are known. So you can literally start putting these operators in this, uh, in this plane, right? Uh, you can, for any operator, you can uh, plot the dimension and the dimension of the first scalar appearing in the OPE of this operator with itself. And if you do that, you discover that one is there and the others one are there. Then they eventually they accumulate somewhere. Sorry, yes. I'm so confused about the numbers because the 
Right, so you're thinking in terms of H and H bar. Uh, and delta is H plus H bar. And the spin is H minus H bar. Right, the delta and L are the quantum numbers of the global symmetry. So, um, okay, so what this plot is telling us is that not only we managed to exclude part of the parameter space, but our, the boundary of the allowed region is saturated by existing CFTs. Of course, this, this CFT is because they exist, and they should be here inside, but it's very non-trivial statement that they uh, saturate the boundary of the allowed region. Okay? And in particular, there is one that sits in a corner of this allowed region. And I, rem I remind you that in this plot, there's nothing, uh, there is no input besides unitarity crossing symmetry and global symmetry, not even Virasoro. While in order to obtain these crosses, you really need to use the Virasoro algebra. So this is a very powerful statement. And because I, because I didn't use at all uh, the Virasoro symmetry, or the Virasoro algebra, I can do the same in any other dimension. So you can ask this question in any other dimension. Is there a qu are there questions about this? Yes. No, no, there are no stupid questions. So the boundary, so here there is no supersymmetry going on. If you use supersymmetry, I'll, I'll probably, uh, no, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to do that, but, um, if you use supersymmetry, you, you might improve this. Because then, if you use supersymmetry from the beginning, you're only proving supersymmetric conformal field theories. And so uh, these are non-supersymmetric conformal field theories, so they don't have to stay inside your allowed region. So, but, uh, what time is it? Right, the boundary, not, the boundary doesn't have it doesn't have always an interpretation. In this case, it does. You can show that each point here is, in fact, an anal analytic continuation of the minimal models, which turns out to be non-unitary. So in principle, you should not see this, these lines, this, 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 this intermediate point, you should not see them. But this non-unitarity doesn't show up in this correlation function. So in this correlation function, you don't see the non-unitary effect because all the operators that you exchange are above unitarity bound, all the OP coefficients are real, so you don't see that. And so this solution is a legitimate solution of crossing for this correlator. If you if you'd use a different correlator, then you wouldn't see. Okay, but generically, the boundary of the of the loud region does not have to be an interpretation. But as we will see now, instead, when you have a feature, so when you have this continuity, most of the time it, it corresponds to something. Okay, uh, I should stop at 11, right? L let me just dr draw one, one picture. And then we continue it. Because now I can redo the same in three dimensions, for instance, where we don't have the full power of Virasoro, we don't have Basically, we don't have anything, okay? There is no complete, complete, completely solvable model in three dimension, um, although there are three theories, of course. So if I do the same example now in three dimension, so I do the same procedure, delta sigma, delta epsilon, I do the same, exactly the same. I just, as you will see in the tutorial, I just change a number in the code. I don't do anything else. And then you run your your algorithm, and you find something like this. Okay, the the, the boundary of the region. So uh, still there is a, an excluded region. There is an allowed region, and there is a feature which in two dimension corresponds to two dimensionalizing model. Okay, so this, 
this is special unitarity, uh, this is special minimal model, which is the Ising model. So you might ask, is, does this uh, feature correspond to something? And then if you go and compare with the uh, calculation that people have done in the three-dimensional Ising model, you will see that the error bars of the three-dimensional Ising model are something like that. So there is, again, a feature corresponding to the 3D Ising model. And so far, it's just a question mark because uh, you don't, I mean, you would like to interpret this as, a, uh, as the location of the three-dimensional Ising model in this plane, but, but you cannot. I mean, uh, in, uh, this is an exclusion plot. It only tells you what, what region is allowed. Still, the boundary of the region seems to give you uh, important information. Okay, I'll stop here and we continue in half an hour. Are there questions? Okay. So let's continue for another hour, and then we, we're going to get our hands dirty and try to produ produce at least some point on this plot. Uh, before, before moving on a, dif on a slightly different topic or generalization of this, I would like to tell you uh, a little bit of story, um, which is, <coughs> so we obtained this plot somehow. And in this plot, as I, I remind you, there, is, there are only very few assumptions. Uh, the assumptions are are uh, basically crossing symmetry, um, unitarity, and conformal symmetry. And yet, we obtain, we obtain a very non-trivial result. We managed to exclude part of the parameter space, and we have a, an allowed region whose boundary has an interesting feature corresponding to the predicted location of the Ising mode. And of course, here we, have, we basically use anything about our knowledge of, of, uh, of the Ising model. So one might wonder that inputting some more stringent assumption, you might be able to corner a little bit better uh, the, the, the parameter space of the Ising model. And here I'm, using, I'm doing the Ising model because it's probably the simplest example of, CFT, of non trivial CFT that you might think about. So, what do we know about the Ising model? About the Aussie model, we know that it describes, for instance, a uh, transition between, uh, in, in the ferromagnets between order and disorder phase. And you, you might uh, describe this theory, for instance, with the 5 to the 4th interaction. And in the 5 to the 4th interaction, you might add the mass term. And when the mass is positive, you have uh, the disorder phase. When the mass is negative, you have spontaneous symmetry breaking and you go to a, an order phase, and then when the mass is zero, you have uh, exactly, you, you flow exactly to a fixed point, which is the Ising model. And so in, in this theory, just by giving a UV description, even though the UV description is not really computable, but uh, in terms of the UV description, you know that there is only one parameter, one parameter, that you need to tune in order to flow to the fixed point, which is in the in the five to the fourth interaction, this is the the mass square. In a, in a specific spin description, that would be the temperature, for instance. 
So there is only one single parameter uh, that you need to, to tune to zero or to, the, to criticality. You need to tune the, the temperature to the, critica to the critical. Um, to, be, to be more precise, this is T minus TC square. And <coughs> which means, in terms of CFT language, it means that there is only this, this model only has one relevant deformation. If you add this deformation to your Lagrangian, you don't go to the fixed point. And so there should be only one relevant operator, which is singlet under the old symmetries, that you, might add, you, you can add to the Lagrangian in order to uh, deform the model, to flow out of the fixed point. So in, in our language, this means that in the, so if sigma describes the spin fluctuation, if you want, uh, is the spin field, and it has OPE one plus epsilon plus other, it means that epsilon here is the only, is the unique relevant scalar operator that you have in the theory. Okay? Because, simply because you have to tune only one thing. If you add this epsilon to the Lagrangian to, uh, of, of, of the fixed point, you, you, you start the flow. If you add any other scalar, you don't start the flow. And so it means that this is the only unique relevant scalar, which is a singlet under um, the symmetries. What are the symmetries? They are a Z2 in this case. Okay. So this is a, a Z2 even scalar. Sigma is also a scalar and has the man it's relevant, but this is Z2, it's Z2 odd. So this is Z2 even. And sigma, it's also scalar, is also relevant, but is z2 odd. So it doesn't, in the spin interpretation, sigma corresponds to adding an external magnetic field. Um, so if you add an external magnetic field, you also flow to, uh, out of the fixed point. And so you might ask, okay, <coughs> let's assume, let's try to input this condition in, uh, in my bootstrap. Let's assume that now my, my uh, OPE is made out of a, s a relevant scalar and all other scalars here, epsilon prime, epsilon second, whatever, are irrelevant. So the dimension of any scalar operator here, delta, uh, 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 delta scalar, will be larger or equal than the space-time dimension, which is three in this case. So why don't we try to add this? And by doing this, now <coughs> we can repeat for each point in this, in this parameter space, you can repeat the analysis and see if you, of course, you, because you, you made a stronger assumption, um, <coughs> you, ex you expect to exclude more, uh, more points in this parameter space. And indeed, this is the case. If you, if you make this assumption, the, the region that was, that was below the curve becomes something like this. Okay. The line is still, is still allowed, but now the region looks something like this. This is allowed. Okay. So very nice. Uh, <coughs> we, we removed a little bit. Uh, so we got stronger constraint. And the stronger is your, is your assumption, the more you exclude. Okay. In fact, you can even go in the literature of the Monte Carlo simulation, for instance, and look what is the dimension of the next uh, operator. This is a so sort of known uh, by Monte Carlo simulations, for instance, or epsilon expansion. And in fact, epsilon, epsilon prime, the dimension of epsilon prime should so be something like 3.84. So uh, you see it's consistent with our assumption. So if you assume, for instance, that uh, you make a stronger assumption and you modify this by requiring that all other scalars except epsilon is 3.8 or larger than 3.8 to be safe, okay? you see something even stronger, you get something like this. 
Okay, the line should be. But then now it's something like this. And the region allowed is this one. Okay, so uh, you see the crossing symmetry is, ca is carving out a lot of the parameter space, but there is something here re resisting. And there is sort of a finger is telling you, look, there's something there. Okay, you should pay attention. And uh, uh, so this, this is really pointing to the fact that there is some CFT living in, in here. And OK, you can go on and, and, and do more assumptions uh, if you know more th about the theory and hope to uh, make the allow region, for instance, a uh, an isolated region, something not connected to the rest, and hope to interpret that as, a, as a, a really the location of the ISI model. Um, but instead of making stronger and stronger assumptions, which are not very justified, you can do something better. Because so far, we have only used a single correlation function. Okay, so far, we only used crossing symmetry of sigma, 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 sigma. But I told you uh, before that um, a CFT must obey crossing symmetry for all correlation function, and the more correlation function you use, the more constrained you are, you are input, you are, you are probing, and you expect to exclude more in the parameter space. And so one possible direction would be to include more operators in your system of, of crossing equation. And so, uh, for instance, we can imagine to consider the whole set of crossing symmetry equation that come from, from all possible correlation functions, including epsilon and sigma. Sorry, uh, yes, epsilon and sigma. So you would have sigma, 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 epsilon, 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 and then the mixed one, sigma, epsilon, sigma, epsilon. And because sigma is z to odd, you cannot have an odd number of sigmas. So these, in fact, are the only three that you need if you, if you restrict to external operators being sigma and epsilon. So there is a, a, a slight difficulty in using this, which is now, if you look at the third correlation function, there is an OPE, which is this one, which has an expansion in conformal blocks of the form lambda, sorry, f sigma epsilon operator prime square and then conformal blocks. But if you do the another um, OP expansion, let's say this one, okay, you would see that this is uh, a sum over operator appearing in sigma. So these are operator appearing in sigma epsilon, and this is our operator appearing in sigma sigma and epsilon epsilon. And this expansion is not in terms of positive quantities. It's going to be f sigma sigma o times f epsilon epsilon o times conformal blocks. So because of this, we you you lose the positivity. This is doesn't have to be positive. Okay? This can be positive or negative, and so you cannot you don't have any more the interpretation of uh, vectors that must sum with positive uh, coefficient. So it's slightly more complicated. On the other hand, uh, you can phrase this problem in terms of, uh, instead of having vectors with positive coefficient, you can phrase this as matrices contracted with, uh, with vectors that has to be semi-definite positive. So this set of crossing equation you can rewrite as something like uh, lambda, sorry, f sigma sigma o f epsilon epsilon o contracted with a matrix contracted with the same vector f sigma, sig, sorry sigma sigma o f epsilon epsilon o okay <coughs> uh, 
And again, these must sum to zero. And so these are this is sort of uh, you can phrase instead of having vectors that must sum with positive coefficient, you must you, you have matrices that sum contracted with the same vector, and this is again a, um, a condition which is com is a convex condition. So instead of having vectors, you can phrase it in terms of matrices, but it goes through pretty smoothly. Okay, but now in interestingly you have uh, access to a whole set of operators because you, you're probing also operators appearing in another OP, which is a sigma epsilon. And so you have to ask, what is the OP sigma epsilon? And the OP sigma epsilon does not contain the identity because the operators are not the same. Okay? And therefore, sigma epsilon identity would be zero as a three-point function. But you can have si sigma itself, right? Because sigma sigma contains epsilon, plus other operator which I will call sigma prime, plus other stuff. And again, you can use your knowledge about the Ising model, and uh, for instance, in terms of uh, five to the fourth UV description. Okay, if you if you write Lagrangian of the form one half the mu sigma square uh, in Euclidean, it would be lambda over four factorial sigma to the fourth. You can you can <coughs> you can imagine that the so there are some equation of motions for for sigma of the form box sigma something like sigma cube. And this equation of motion is telling you that this operator sigma cube, which in the OPE it would be sigma prime, okay, uh, is related to sigma through derivatives. And in the CFT language, this means that this operator here is a descendant. So uh, you can imagine that in the Lagrange, so from the Lagrangian description, you can sort of conclude. So this is not this is a bit of hand waving argument, but. Uh, from the Lagrangian description, you can conclude that in this expansion, uh, you, would mi you would be missing an operator, sigma prime, because it's not a primary, it's a descendant. And so you may imagine, and this is actually true confirmed by experiment, that also sigma is the only relevant Z2, Z2 odd uh, scalar. Okay? And so you can repeat everything that I've done so far, using two assumptions. Epsilon is the only relevant. Relevant. I mean, even if you don't buy that argument, you can do this analysis. Okay. Z2 even. And sigma is the only relevant. Z to odd. Okay. So this is a, a particular as set of assumptions that you can probe using the bootstrap. Okay. It's a it's an assumption that constrains the, the spectrum. And so now, <coughs> if you do that, you will see that the green region almost disappears. And what you are left with is a very tiny island here and a continuum here. Okay, so there is a, in, in this part of the parameter space, there's nothing left except a very small island. center around the expected values of the Ising model. And if you push the numerics, what does it mean to push the numerics? It means to consider more and more uh, larger and larger functionals. It means include more and more derivatives in your, uh, in your expansion of, of, the of the crossing equation. 
And something that I didn't tell you, but it uh, should be obvious if you, if you, think, if you think for a second, is that if you incl include more crossing equations, so if you enlarge the search space for your functional, you can only do better. Okay, so every, all the plots that I show can only be improved by making your search space larger. And so, so far, people have managed to push this, this program uh, quite a bit. And in the delta sigma, delta epsilon space, if you zoom around that island, you have a prediction, the best prediction known so far was from Monte Carlo, and it was something like this. Okay. Uh, perhaps I should put some... Uh, sincerely, I don't remember the numbers now. Uh, I have them on, on the laptop. But <coughs> so this should be something like 0 0.218, and this could be something like 0 0.2184, something like that. And this should be 1.4, and this could be 1.42. I I don't don't trust this number. Okay, you can find it on the literature, and I think they are also in, in the notebook. The point is, uh, compared to w what is the Monte Carlo prediction compared to the Monte Carlo, and the Butzer prediction so far is something like this. Okay, so very impressive. So this is like five digits uh, precision, and on top of this, these five digits are definite. Okay, definitive, sorry. You can, you can only improve those. There is no error there, because you can, you can imagine to work to a very high precision in Kofova blocks, like 200 digit precision. Uh, you can include as many spins in your, uh, in your, you can impose positivity on as many spins as you want, and there's also uh, some proof of expo exponential decoupling of higher dimensional operators. So it's, it's literally all the errors are exponentially suppressed. And so this is the result that we uh, obtain just using this set of assumptions, which is a very minimal set of assumptions. Okay. So now, let me give you uh, perhaps a timeline of, of bootstrap development. And if you're not very excited by this result, perhaps uh, you might want to explore other directions. So in the next half an hour or so, I would like to talk about something else. Unless there are questions. Questions? So just a timeline, historical timeline. Okay, so we start in the 70s, and we are today. Okay, so here we have laces. And in the 70s, and so 73, there was a paper by Ferrara, Gatto, Grillo, and the, day after, and the year after by Polyakov, which sort of formulated the idea of bootstrap. Right? They formulated the idea that using crossing symmetry, you should be able to do something like this. And then people tried, so there was some success in 2D. And then people simply abandoned the idea for many years um, <coughs> because nobody managed to extend this program to higher dimensional where you don't have Virasoro. So the success of 2D heavily relied on Virasoro. And then 2004, there was a paper by Donald and Osborne that I cited the other day which computed the conformal blocks for uh, two and four dimensions for scalars which made possible four years later, in 2008, the first bound uh, of that form in four dimensions by myself and other people. <coughs> and then, over the years, people started developing machinery. So last year, 2016, 
we made this picture. So uh, 3D icing. And then now it's a sort of established enough uh, field that can be thought at laces. Okay? So just to tell you that it's a very recent field. So if you want to jump in, you're very welcome. Um, OK, so starting from this vanilla version of the, of the bootstrap, you might want to explore different direction. Because so far, I've been discussing real fields, uh, perhaps with a zero symmetry. But the Ising model is as much as you can get from there. So starting from the vanilla bootstrap, you can explore different direction. You can ask yourself what happens if I, instead of using a single field, a real field, I can include some global symmetry. For instance, if you assume that your fundamental field transforms under some, representa uh, some irreducible representation of a, a global symmetry group, um, uh, you can do that. Or you can go and study non-scalars. Okay. Uh, this is very complicated, uh, because, and we only managed to do it two years ago, because when you start considering uh, spinning objects, then the three-point function become more complicated because you have more than, more than one tensor structure going on, and the conformal blocks are more complicated. But the only dif dif difficulty there is to compute the conformal blocks. There's no major improvement besides uh, just computing the conformal blocks. And then a third direction that I would like to discuss uh, briefly is what happens when you consider super conformal field theory. So you, if you add supersymmetry in the game. So unless there are strong preferences on that, uh, on that direction, I would like to spend a few words on supersymmetry. So in supersymmetry, <coughs> when you start including supersymmetry in the game, the algebra uh, of the conformal group is extended to a superconformal algebra. And uh, in particular, so the superconformal super transformations are the set of transformations that preserve, instead of the usual uh, the S square in flat space, you have something like the x mu square, well, the x mu, the x mu. Um, sorry, let's let's write like this: the x mu plus i. You have the Grassmann variables theta, sigma mu. Theta bar, d theta bar, plus the other one, i theta bar, sigma bar mu, theta, d theta, square. <coughs> this is the, the, the line element that you need to, um, to preserve. And so uh, on top of the usual generators, p mu, and here I'm, I'm doing n equal 1. n equal 1 in four dimensions. For because at least I can write the, the algebra on the blackboard. <coughs> so in addition to the usual p mu, and mu nu, and uh, k mu, which are the generator of the conformal symmetry, you also have other generators. In particular, you have the supercharges of supersymmetry which I will, I will denote Q alpha. You have the um, Q, Q bar alpha dot, which is the compass conjugate. And then, <coughs> sorry, here there's also dilatation. And then when you start composing this Q and, uh, and Q bar with, um, with K, 
you see that these are, are not enough. Okay. Um, you need to include other generators. So you need to include a generator which is called uh, is the generator of is the partner, if you want, of KMU, is a supersymmetric partner of KMU. These are supersymmetric partner of P, and this is a supersymmetric partner of P mu. And it's a generator which has uh, an index mu and an index alpha. Or alpha down. There is the analog uh, S bar mu alpha dot. And then these are still not enough. You need to include another generator, which I will call uh, A usually, which is uh, an, a, a generator of <coughs> the, the R charge. Okay, and if you start uh, com writing the algebra of this, you will see that it closes and it has very nice properties. So in particular, you can see that uh, the commutation relation of D and Q tells you that Q has dimension one half. So the action of Q on state produces a state with dimension D plus one half. And, and Q bar has dimension uh, also one half. Um, you can see that, <coughs> what else you can see? You can see that, uh, so first of all, you can ask what are the generators that you can diagonalize. And generators that you can diagonalize simultaneously are um, mu nu, d, and a. Okay, and this uniquely identify uh, the quantum number of, of state with as uh, the, the spin. So an operator will, be ha will have spin jj bar in four dimension. We have dimension delta, and we have uh, some R charge, which I, which I call little r. And <coughs> alternatively, you can you can use some other some other numbers, which are q uh, instead of delta and r, you can use q q bar, uh, j and j bar, which are some other quantum numbers and are related to uh, so delta is q plus q bar and the r charge is um, two third q minus q bar okay <coughs> so this uh, these are the quantum numbers of an operator and then you would like to because now you have super conformal symmetry the operator should be organized in irreducible representation of the conform of the superconformal algebra. So, um, by studying the superconformal algebra, you can see that acting with the new generators, q q bar and s s bar. If you start from a primary, you can end up with uh, with other primaries. Okay, so it generically, an irreducible representation of the superconformal algebra will contain more than one primary under the conformal group. And in particular, S and S bar act at, um, have a very similar action as KMU. So they are sort of descending operator while QQ bar are raising operators. And so you can generalize the condition of, of being primary to being super primary. So super primaries will be those operators that are not only annihilated by Q, equal to zero, but also by um, S and S bar. Here I'm suppressing indices, okay, just for for shortness. So this will be a superconformal primary. And starting from a superconformal primary, you can act with uh, with QQ bar or with P mu and generate ordinary descendants or 
super conformal descendant using QQ bar, which can be, however, conformal primaries. So let's make a, a sort of a table, uh, which would be definitely not rigorous. So let's say you start from a super conformal primary, O, dimension delta, uh, in the representation JJ bar, and R charge little r. You can start from, so this is uh, the top component, or if you want the, the lowest component in, uh, in, the, in this uh, irreducible representation of the super conformal algebra. And then you can usually, you can act with Q, or you can act with Q bar, okay, and generate other objects, which are, again, primaries, but not super conformal primaries. So you can generate objects that are that still satisfy this condition, but do not satisfy this condition anymore. So here you have uh, this is usually denote Q O, Q bar O. Okay, and then you can go on, act with Q square O. You can act with Q bar square. Okay. <coughs> so generically, you don't generate only primaries, you generate a combination of primaries and, and descendants, but you can, extra, you can remove the descendants. Or you can do the other, the other way around and get QQ bar. Oh, and okay, the blackboard is over, but you can continue this. So generically, the, the punchline is that if you have a super, uh, um, an irreducible representation of the co of super conformal Algebra, it will contain an, uh, an operator which is the, uh, the super conformal primary plus other operators which are still primaries but not super conformal primaries. And so, because of this sort of table, the, the effect of having supersymmetry is to relate different three point functions that would be otherwise uh, unrelated in a, in a non SUSY theory. Just to make a, a concrete example, and there would be much more to say, but this is to give you the philosophy. Okay. <coughs> if you consider the so-called Ferrara Zumino, Zumino. Super multiplet. This is, this is the multiplet that contains this, the energy momentum tensor. And uh, however, the, you can show that the energy momentum tensor T mu nu so this one, is not a super primary. It's actually a super descendant. And what is a super primary of that multiplet is a, again a conserved charge, J. Um, Alpha alpha dot is a, is a spin one object, has one index uh, dot and one and dot. <coughs> and this is the conserved current of R symmetry. Okay, and if you start from this, you see that. Uh, the, the energy momentum tensor is actually a QQ bar descendant of J. Okay. And also, uh, other conserved current associated to the other transformation are contained in the same supermultiplet. Uh, um, also, the conserved current associated to, um, uh, for instance, um, S and S bar. Okay, so this is one object, for instance. And so this means <coughs> that if you consider in a super conformal symmetry, if you consider the three point function of a scalar, say, phi, which would be a scalar of some, for instance, you can take, a, um, I don't know, you can take this phi to be a component of a chiral super multiplet, chiral. Uh, Supermultiplet. 
scalar supermultiple. The lowest, the lowest component of a chiral superfield is a scalar, you can call it phi. And then phi bar, which is the lowest component of the, of the complex conjugate. And then t mu nu. Okay. This object here, true supersymmetry, will be related to phi, phi, j. Which is the three point function, sorry, phi phi bar, <coughs> which is the three point function of two scalar and they are symmetric area. Normally, these are, in a non supersymmetric theory, these, two point, these three point functions are completely unrelated. In a, in a supersymmetric theory, there will be a relation. Okay. So, in a supersymmetric theory, the, the important, the, the consequence of supersymmetry are that you relate stuff that otherwise would be, would be unrelated. And so <coughs> if you consider now four-point function of scalars, for instance, in a super conformal field theory, you can rearrange the conformal block exp expansion into a super conformal block expansion. So if I do, for instance, phi, phi bar, phi, phi bar, okay? If you remember the expression that we had yesterday, you can write this as a sum over uh, operators in the reducible representation, phi, phi bar. Um, there was the projector on this p, on this uh, irreducible representation, and then phi, phi bar. Okay, but now because of supersymmetry, you you would like to repackage all this this expansion into an expansion only of superprimaries, or oh, superprimary. Primary. Okay. Same thing. Oh, five five bar. And here you have a sum over sup all the super descendant p o oh, phi phi bar because three point functions are related and so what this object here which is a sum over super descendant super descendant but primaries but conformal primaries So this quantity here is called a superconformal block. And it's just a combination of a finite number of usual conformal block with some coefficient that are completely fixed by the super the, the, by the super algebra. See if I have an example. Um, I don't have an example. Well, I can give you an example without the coefficient. For instance, the superconformal blocks for this specific case. That's called. Carly G. So this is a superconformal block associated to a super primary with dimension L and spin uh, dimension delta and spin L. This will be a sum of well, you have the contribution of the primary, the super primary, which is the usual conformal block. Uh, if you normalize things properly, okay. Then you have uh, what can what can you have? Well, you can have all contribution from all the operators which have the right uh, quantum numbers to enter this OPE. So we know that in the, in the OPE of scalars, there can only be a traceless symmetric operator. So all the non-traceless symmetric operator in the same supermultiplet of, of this operator will not appear. And also they have to have the right R charge. So basically you have uh, something like G uh, 
delta plus 1, L plus 1, which is, this corresponds to, with some coefficient, this corresponds to operators of the form QQ bar acting on O. This is O. Okay, and you can construct QQ bar in two different ways. Either you increase the spin or you, incre or you decrease the spin. So there will be another one. And the delta plus one comes from the fact that this object, because there are one Q and one Q bar, has dimension one higher. So there will be also a conformal block of the form delta plus one, L minus one. Okay, so this, this, ob this object here uh, can give you two contributions. And then there can be another, which is uh, G delta plus two, L, which comes from acting with four supercharges. So Q square, Q bar square, O. And because you have Q square and Q bar square, they only can, can be contracted among themselves, and so they cannot change the spin. So the spin of this object is the same as the spin of the original one. And, look, and there is a, some number here again, and the, all these numbers can be computed by computing the relation between three-point function and four-point function in a supersymmetric theory. So the only difference between what I, I said and what is going on in a superconformal field theory is just that you have to find out this relation between, uh, <coughs> between different three-point functions. But these relations, nicely, nicely enough, they will be, uh, this coefficient will be, again, functions of deltas and L, and they're rational function, so everything goes through again. Okay, so as an example, uh, let, me let me present you, for instance, what happens in n equal 4. Of course, I cannot write the algebra of n equal 4 on the blackboard, so, and there would be a lot of uh, missing ingredient in this discussion, but just to give you a flavor of what would go on, would be going on. So, example n equal 4 in four dimension <coughs> so in the n equal four so starting from n equal 2 in four dimension you have enough supersymmetry such that the multiplet the super multiplet that contains the stress tensor also contain a scalar and so we can use our approach for scalar to study correlation function of the super multiplet that contains the stress tensor. So in the, in, in the case of n equal 4, the super multiplet is usually called capital phi, okay, and is, uh, has two indices, say phi ab, because it belongs to the, so in, in n equal 4, in four dimension, you have, a, not only you have the R symmetry, but you also have, well, you also have a capital R symmetry, which is a global symmetry, and in this case is SU4. Because you have four, so four different kinds of supercharges. And so operator will be, uh, <coughs> will be classified in terms of representation of also the SU4. And in particular, the multiplet that contains the stress tensor is in the representation 0 to 0 of SU4, which is, uh, in terms of Young diagrams, something like this. <coughs> it's called the 20 prime. Okay. So this is a super, super multiplet. It contains many operator, but the lowest component, the, the smallest dimension one, is a scalar of dimension two. And then you, con then you start acting with supercharges, and you generate an object which, is, uh, which has dimension four and spin two, and it's the stress tensor. But the lowest component is a scalar of dimension two, fixed. And so you can, you can start, you can take this object and study the correlation function of the scalar. Phi, phi AB, phi CD, phi EF, phi uh, G. 
GH. Okay, this will have <coughs> a tensor structure to reproduce these indices and different tensor structure. There will be more than one tensor structure corresponding to different representation that you can uh, exchange because when you take uh, 20 primes times 20 primes, uh, this decomposes in different representations of uh, of SU4 will be the singlet there would be some other I don't, don't remember all of them there is a hundred five <coughs> okay so each tensor structure corresponds to the exchange of an operator in a given irreducible representation so it, it looks very complicated but fortunately because there are because this object here it's it's a uh, um, contains conserved current, so it, you, you, you might well understand that it has to satisfy some uh, conservation condition. And so, or, or if you want uh, multiple shortening um, due to supersymmetry. So if you impose all, all these conditions, these, these are sort of world identities, in the end, you end up with a very simple equation, which remarkably looks like the one for the IC model with a very minor modification. And it looks something like this, okay? Uh, so the, the only, if you want, the only non-trivial crossing symmetry, crossing equation is of the form v square, a function g u b, which I will write in a second, minus u square, the function g v u. Okay. This is sort of the crossing equation. Then the, there is another piece, which normally is not there. So this is for u minus v over a. And this A is related to the central charge. Well, actually, is the central charge of the system. And this, this A here is the central charge. And <coughs> this function G admits um, a, a superconformal block decomposition. So I don't expect that you understand where this comes from. I mean, it's a, it's a very long derivation. But the point is that it's a, it's a crossing uh, equation, very similar to the one we had studied. And it also admits a conformal block decomposition, very similar to what we have studied, only that it splits into in two pieces. There is one piece which, which I will call G short, and a piece which I will call G long. And the difference is that G short is the contribution to this function to all operators that are pr protected. Because in n equal 4, uh, as much as n equal 2, you can prove that there are operators in the theory which have protected dimension. And those are the one half, op one half BPS and one quarter BPS operators. Not only they have protected uh, dimension, they also have protected OP coefficient uh, with, with the energy momentum tensor. And so this quantity here, it's totally determined in a sense. By the superconformal algebra, and you can compute it. Instead, G long is uh, the contribution to this function coming from long multiplets. And these long multiples are not protected, nor in their dimension, nor in their OP coefficient. So this is the one, this is the function that you would like to bootstrap in a sense. This is the function which, is, which contains some freedom. And interestingly enough, the only operator that contribute to this G-long in this whole business are singlets under the R symmetry. Those are operators in the zero, zero, zero represent representation. So there is only one 
kind of operator that ent that are and those are the singlet under the old, all the symmetries and the only assumptions that you can make in your theory are on the spectrum and the OP coefficient of these operators and people have done that there's a paper by the Stony Brook group by uh, Rastelli, Van Ries, uh, Beam, and who else? No one else. There are two papers on this. Uh, one is called N equal force per conformal bootstrap, and another one is more N equal force per conformal bootstrap. <laughs> <Not there. laughs> and <coughs> so notice that here the dimension of the external operator is fixed so you cannot do a plot like before in which you vary the dimension of the external parameter and you look at uh, the, man the constraints on dimension of scalar operators so what you can do instead are make assumptions on operator exchanged only as a function for instance of the, of the central charge and so they did that and for instance um, you can look at the dimension of the first scalar as a function of 1 over A okay. uh, <coughs> and you can see that this looks something like so A is the central charge A go 1 over A going to 0 corresponds to very large cent central charge which corresponds to, uh, in, the, in the ADS-CFT correspondence, corresponds to having very large, large n. Okay, so in A going to infinity limit, you would like to at least to see that you can reproduce the large n prediction. So what they did, they obtained a bound, which looks something like this. Sorry. Uh, they obtained something like um, they have sort of points. These are uh, sort of error bars because they cannot determine very well um, the prediction. So these are sort of error bars, and if you superimpose this with a prediction from large n, you see something like very nice. You see that they agree. And this is the, la the large n prediction, which is delta 0, something like 4 minus 4 over a. And similarly, you can do a, a same game for uh, spin 2 and spin 4. You can bound the dimension of the first spin 2 and spin 4. Okay? And it also agree with the large n prediction in the region where it's supposed to to um, <coughs> to agree, but you can even go to small central charges, and for small central charges we don't have an ADS interpretation because we don't have uh, the, the ADS CFT correspondence allows you to compute stuff only in the limit of large central charge. In the other limit, you don't know uh, really what's going on. In the other limit, what you can do, you can do a Feynman diagram exp expansion in in the coupling G and Mills. And uh, okay, you can try to match with the with the bootstrap result, but the bootstrap can can go for any va can go all the way down to very small a. In fact, there is also a prediction, which is a has to be uh, larger than uh, three fourth, if I remember correctly, which comes from the argument of chiral algebra. Okay, and in that, in the, for very small a, we don't know what is um <coughs> what saturates the bound. Uh, we we know where to to put some theories, uh, but they don't saturate the bound. So it's a very open problem to understand what are the theories that saturate the bound, if any, uh, at small central charges. Okay, I think I'll but I'll stop here. Just a remark. Besides the complication of supersymmetry, 
to do this kind of analysis, you need exactly the same techniques that you need to do two-dimensional, three-dimensionalizing mode. There's nothing technically, no more, no more complication except supersymmetry. So if you like supersymmetry, you can just apply the same machinery. Okay, I'll stop the lecture here, and the next hour there will be sort of a tutorial on how to produce these plots. Thanks for the attention.